Good afternoon and welcome to AIG Public Health Talk. Today is World Heart Day. We Indians usually consider ourselves as very hearty in terms of our actions, our emotions and in terms of the overall outlook that we have for the entire life as well. But at the same time, over 60 million people in India are suffering from various cardiovascular diseases. So is it the right time in the middle of this pandemic so that we should actually start taking uh, very seriously how we can take care of our heart and you know uh, prevent these uh, huge burden of the cardiovascular disease that's currently in our country. So to, to discuss this we have Dr. Rajiv Menon who is the senior consultant of uh, intervention cardiology here at AIG hospitals. Welcome sir. Good afternoon Robin. Uh, thanks for having me here. Yeah. So to start with, I would like to know how this entire landscape of cardiovascular diseases in India has changed over the years. Uh, say, if you compare this with what, what the kind of incidence that you're seeing in today's OPDs and the way it was there in the last, say, 20, 30 years back. Yeah, Robin, I think uh, there's something which is very obvious in the last uh, few decades. And uh, that is that uh, more and more uh, younger population we are finding are getting affected by heart disease. Now if you just uh, go back and uh, look at uh, literature, uh, we come to know that uh, we as Indians are at a higher risk of developing heart problem compared to the European or the other Western countries. Actually to put it in perspective, uh, we are known to have the cardiac disease at about 10 years earlier. Uh, one of the concepts which have been uh, put forward is uh, what is called as the thrifty genotype and phenotype which basically says that uh, we are made to live in uh, conditions of famine and then suddenly when we have plenty that is even uh, when we eat the normal food the normal calories which is recommended that itself is high for us because uh, over a period of centuries the whole genotype has changed in such a way that it has got used to living in famineous conditions so uh, that's the concept based on which there was a lot of research uh, which was done and surprisingly it was found that uh, Indians, uh, say the same Indians who are there in America and are taking the same food, uh, they tend to develop a heart problem about 10 years earlier. Now that's not, uh, that's just not the bad news. The other issues are we tend to develop more severe form of disease, like if you compare the extent of bypass surgery in our country compared to other countries, it's much higher in our country. The third aspect is we tend to have smaller vessels. Actually, they, there used to be a joke that uh, doctors from Western countries, when they come here, they find it difficult to do because our vessels are very small compared to the Western population. That's what we find when we are doing angioplasty. The normal stent size which we use is much smaller compared to what is used in the Western population. So smaller vessels, more severe disease and earlier onset of disease. This was already there in Indians. Now to add to that, last two to three decades with so much of junk food being dumped into our country and a complete change in lifestyle, we are realizing that it's occurring much more in the younger population. Just to give you some statistics, uh, we had uh, just analyzed our data of patients who come with acute heart attack. And when we compared the high-tech city, the Gachiboli area compared to the other areas from our uh, previous experience, we realized that uh, nearly 26% of the people were less than 40 years of age and uh, nearly 38 percent of the people were less than 50 uh, years of age. Now this is productive life. So we are talking about people who are the sole bread earners of the family now coming with a heart attack which can probably uh, make them bedridden or develop, uh, uh, put them into some kind of a heart failure for the rest of their life. And this is about 10 years younger than what our data suggested in the other parts of the city. So people in the IT sector with their uh, way of life, uh, night outs, partying every day, smoking, some of the IT sectors if you go, the parking spaces are like smoking chambers. You go there, you need not uh, smoke a cigarette, you have enough smoke there, enough tobacco there. So almost 10 years younger than the normal Indian population. So that is quite shocking and uh, that's quite dangerous. So this is a complete shift which we have seen in the last two to three decades. The other aspect is the shift in the rural population. We hardly used to see 
patients coming with acute heart attack from the rural areas. But now again, because of smoking and the change in lifestyle which is occurring in the rural population, we are finding more and more heart attacks coming from there and there are hardly any facilities in the remote area. So that again uh, is uh, quite a dangerous aspect which we are seeing. So uh, not a very rosy no uh, news, at least last two, three decades uh, we have made giant strides as far as the management of heart disease is concerned. But at the same time, the number of people developing heart disease has gone up, basically because the prevention aspect has uh, significantly fallen short of the desired outcomes. Yeah. So you mean to say that we were, as a population, we were always more vulnerable towards uh, heart diseases and on top of that, we added the newer lifestyle and the newer way of life, which eventually made us much more vulnerable. Exactly. So that obviously brings us to the question that uh, since you talked about the corporate audience, and the IT going people who are there uh, and they are now much more you know vulnerable in this and apart from this smoking and all is there a stress factor also which contributes to this uh, high number of cases that you're seeing yeah we call it the beta factor so uh, corporate uh, the timelines they have to finish projects uh, which uh, require about uh, six months in about a month's time so huge uh, work pressure and then uh, working according to US timings or any other western country timings, these things completely change your diurnal uh, uh, clock. So the body is tuned to a particular uh, diurnal variation, the daytime, the hormones, all these things vary. And then when you reverse that totally, that adds significant amount of stress. And the brain and heart cannot be separated from each other. The more the stress in the brain, that's going to have a lot of adverse outcomes in heart. So many of our movies which used to show, right, that suddenly some bad news is there and they catch the chest with some heart attack and all. That's not far from truth and uh, th that we are seeing every day patients, uh, most of the cases who come to us with acute heart attack when we go in detail about their history, some uh, stress they have gone through in the recent past, either job stress, family stress, whatever or financial stress, some kind of stress they have gone through in the recent past. So that makes a difference. Yeah. So. Th one more very worrying fact uh, that you have mentioned is that the number of younger population or the number of uh, people under the age of 40 who are you know now coming with heart attacks and all the stuff so what are the key you know we would like to categorically state those risk factors what are the key risk factors that especially this bunch of population is uh, having which are making them much more prone to heart diseases so in general, uh, I'll let you know that uh, the risk factors which are considered uh, to increase the chances of heart disease, of course, uh, will be high blood pressure, uh, presence of diabetes, smoking, a strong family history of coronary artery disease, and increased cholesterol. These are some of the basic risk factors which are considered to increase the risk. Now in this younger population, specifically what we are seeing is the issue of smoking that is huge. Now, in addition to that, as you mentioned, the question about uh, stress and of course the dietary habits. Dietary habits which translate into either diabetes or to increased cholesterol. So, those are the ones which we are finding in the younger population. Number one risk factor, smoking. Okay. So, uh, so moving ahead a little uh, towards uh, the other aspect which is, you know, what happens actually when you, when you don't take these precautions? because the, we have been talking about these precautions from I think several decades now that you don't do this, you keep your you know heart healthy, you exercise properly or you have some you know less diet and whatever. But uh, what happens if you don't take this precaution? What happens actually inside the heart which makes you uh, you know vulnerable or makes you go through this? So we need to understand that the blood supply to the heart, the heart itself doesn't supply to itself. So from the heart there is a large vessel which is called the iota which supplies blood to the entire body and it also supplies the blood to the heart. So there are small vessels called coronaries which come out from the iota and then pass over the heart. So there are three main coronary vessels which go over the heart and supply the entire myocardium that is the muscle of the heart. Now these vessels will have a vessel wall and there is a very smooth coating inside which allows the blood to flow very smoothly. It's just like a canal. And imagine that the canal has smooth surface and the water is just flowing very comfortably. So here the blood is flowing very comfortably. Any roughness or any increase in the friction that can cause the blood to slow down and it can produce a clot. 
Now, why does this occur? This occurs because either when you are smoking, the vessel gets constricted or the vessel wall breaks, the endothelial layer, that is the inner layer of the vessel can break. Two, it can occur because the cholesterol causes the fat to get deposited within the vessel, so that makes the layer uh, very thin and that can again break and produce a clot. So these are different ways, similarly diabetes which can affect again by uh, causing some changes in the oxidative stress which can again make the vessel prone to develop a rupture. So in any of these situations, the basic smooth layer of the wall is getting compromised and there suddenly once the lower layers below the endothelium they get exposed, they are very sticky. So all the cells of the blood, they go and attach there and form a clot. Once a clot forms, the blood supply stops and then that produces a heart attack. Now there are two things which you should remember. One is what is called as angina. That means slowly there is a cholesterol deposition within the vessel. The circulation to the muscle is coming down. So normally when the patient is at rest, they may not feel anything. But once they start walking or exerting, when the heart rate increases, the BP increases, they go through a emotional stress. That is the time when the heart needs more blood. And because it is narrow, it cannot make up for that. In normal people, it can increase by about 5 to 10 times the blood flow. But in these patients, because of the blockade, it cannot increase and the patient complains of chest pain. That is angina. But heart attack is different. Heart attack is where there is a sudden breakage in the vessel wall, there is a clot formation and there is a upward, uh, abrupt blockade of the vessel. And that produces a sudden pain and then produces a heart attack. So, it, 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 all these risk factors, it's not that people who do not have risk factors won't develop heart attack. At the same time, it's not that people with all risk factors will develop heart attack. It is the probability, the chances yeah. of developing. If they don't have the chances that they will develop is much less. Compared to people, if they have all these risk factors, the chances that they will develop a heart attack are much higher. Yeah. So, you also mentioned about uh, the connection between diabetes and uh, you know, hypertension. And uh, many of the diabetic are known to have this, what, what's called the silent heart attack, in which they even don't know that they are undergoing a heart attack. So, how do they, uh, you know, what are the early symptoms that they can recognize and then you know uh, within time they can reach out to the um, emergency medic. So that is an excellent question. Actually uh, we are the diabetes capital of the world and Hyderabad is considered to be uh, among the cities the diabetes capital of the world. Uh, very unfortunate. Now uh, diabetes uh, what it does is normally how does pain occur because there are certain nerves which are there in the heart and when the circulation has come down and the muscle is starved of blood, it sends those signals to the nerve which goes to the brain and you get the feeling of pain. Now in diabetes, as you know, diabetes uh, produces what is called neuropathy. In You will have some tingling numbness in the legs, in the feet, in the uh, uh, palms. Similar to that, it can damage the nerves to the heart. So that is the reason why the patient may not develop a pain at all. So for patients who are diabetic, it is necessary that they get regular cardiac checkup at least a ECG, any baseline ECG changes, it is necessary that they do functional assessment. And then we call what are called as the fun uh, anginal equivalents. That means the patient may not have pain, which is angina. They might have equivalents. What are those equivalents? They could just have breathlessness. Suppose a diabetic while walking is developing breathlessness, that could be an indirect sign of a heart disease. They could have giddiness, patient walking and developing giddiness. While walking, they have tiredness, just extreme fatigue or fatigue on walking that itself could be an indirect sign of angina. Palpitations. Patient feels as if his heart is racing when they are mm -hmm. uh, walking. That could be an angina equivalent. Mm -hmm. So any of these could be angina equivalents. There is another very interesting aspect which probably through this forum I would like to share. We have what is called as a concept of referred pain. That means when the brain is continuously getting stimulated by a pain from a particular area, when the pain comes from the heart, it mistakes that the pain is coming from that area. Say somebody has osteoarthritis of the knee and continuously the patient is experiencing that knee pain repeatedly daily and uh, over periods of weeks, months and years. Now when he starts having angina, instead of angina, he starts having pain in the knee. Mm -hmm. I am just giving an extreme yeah, example. Yeah, yeah. So anything unusual, a diabetic when he feels that there is something unusual, he is not the same. He was probably doing treadmill for half an hour. Now he is able to do only for 15 minutes. Anything unusual in a diabetic should prompt a cardiac evaluation to rule out an anginal equivalent. Yeah. So there are other instances also where uh, they can be, you know, very similar kind of symptoms. Like there are many, uh, I would say, 
gastrointestinal problems also which can cause you know pain inside the upper abdomen area so how do any lay person can differentiate that whether it is a heart related problem or it's something because the general in a population they tend to take these things as another gi problem or something which they can probably pop up a uh, you know a digestive pill and it will go away so how do they uh, you know differentiate that so generally if you look at the nerve supply of the heart the pain of a cardiac origin can start anywhere from the jaw up to the umbilicus okay anywhere you can get pain so it could be shoulder it could be neck it could be tooth so there are patients who had a heart attack and had their tooth removed because they had severe pain in the tooth and then the dentist uh, pulled out the tooth and then realized the pain is not subsiding that's when they took a ecg and then realized that the patient was having a ongoing heart attack at that time right similarly the acid peptic symptoms so retrosternal burning uh, esophagitis uh, the feeling of gas shoulder pains any of these things could be related to a cardiac issue now the best thing to do is when in doubt always try to rule out a cardiac problem 9 nine out of 10 times you thought it was cardiac but it turned out to be gi or a gastric issue it's not going to harm you but one out of 10 times you missed a cardiac problem and treated it as a gi or something else it could be disastrous it could be a death sentence to that particular patient so when in doubt you should always try to treat it as cardiac now many people uh, again in the general population they feel okay they are necessarily admitted and then uh, there was no need it was not heart related any pain you go these people admit uh, i'll just give you an example one of the most famous head of departments of all india institute when uh, he had uh, uh, angina and chest pain he actually thought that it is a gastric problem Oh. and when it did not subside after taking antacids then he took a ecg and realized that it is cardiac so a stalwart in cardiology if he is not able to differentiate whether it is cardiac or gastric you can imagine how well a lay person will be able to differentiate whether it is cardiac or gastric so we should not simplify things which are complex okay. it is almost near impossible in a emergency situation to differentiate whether it is cardiac or gastric so ecg might be normal okay if it's abnormal yes it is cardiac if troponin which is the cardiac enzyme we do if that is abnormal yes it is cardiac but normalcy of ecg normalcy of troponin doesn't say that it is not cardiac so that is the uh, uh, tricky point there so that's the reason why any time you are in doubt always treat it as cardiac and there is no harm by giving treatment and giving cardiac medications you are not going to kill the patient mm -hmm. and you do some more investigations the next day and finally if it is clear it's not cardiac then that's good good for everyone and then they can always stop those drugs and go back home yeah so i think the key take away here is that do not ignore uh, these symptoms even if it turns out to be a gastric issue that's well and good but do not uh, ignore if you are having any kind of a unusual pain in any upper part of the body for layman purpose you should consult uh, the cardiologist at the earliest and Now, any time of the day or any, night yeah so because yeah. time is muscle yeah if you had a heart attack at 1 o'clock in the night and you think okay fine tomorrow morning 7 o'clock we'll go then that's the end of the story because 6 hours has gone the muscle has got damaged after that you do bypass angioplasty you do whatever you want you're not going to recover that muscle mm -hmm. so it's extremely important at that point when you have you can you should go to the er of the hospital we are fortunate enough that in our place we have a cardiologist who is capable of doing angioplasty in a acute mi situation available 24 into 7 irrespective of whether it's a holiday or whether it is a sunday they are available 24 into 7 mm -hmm. and what the patient needs to do is just walk into the emergency and rest of the things are taken care of all right so that that brings me to the question sir so what are the key factors that you know what happens is usually when when there's an emergency there's a lot of panic there's a lot of fear so what are the important factors that a patient should consider uh, with the hospital or uh, with the cardiac center so that they can be uh, you know they can have much more trust in them and what are, what makes a cardiac center holistic in terms of dealing with these kind of very you know uh, emergency cases yeah of course i think it finally boils down to the amount of trust which the patient has in a particular hospital but one important aspect is if the patient is unstable or not doing well they have to reach the center which is closest and naturally that center should be good enough to handle uh, any cardiac emergency 
not that you go to a, a place where uh, nobody is available, not even a nurse is there, but at least uh, try to identify a decent center where there's a cardiologist on duty or a good doctor on duty, a good emergency setup, a good critical care setup. And when in emergency, try to first rush to the nearest place. If you have access to ambulance, the best thing is to call for ambulance and go in ambulance because most of the ambulances nowadays are like ICCU on wheels. So they have uh, professional uh, doctors, they have technicians and insist that uh, they call for a cardiac ambulance so that all these equipment as well as the personnel, there might be equipment but if somebody doesn't know how to use defib, it's of no use. So a proper uh, emergency trained technician, a proper emergency trained uh, doctor, a paramedic, all of them are there in the ambulance and if they come, the moment they reach, then it will be much easier for them to handle the things. Going in your own vehicle may not be a very intelligent uh, thing to do, especially in rush hours, because you might get caught up in traffic and then uh, if somebody has a cardiac arrest on the way, that's going to be disastrous. So at least if you have uh, ambulance services available, call for a proper cardiac ambulance and then try to go to the nearest center if you are unstable or whichever hospital uh, you feel uh, is good enough to go. So, uh, right that you talked about the trust factor in this case, uh, the trust factor also is dependent on the kind of communication a doctor does with the patient when the patient walks in and maybe a patient is requiring some kind of a cardiac intervention. Uh, so how do you establish that kind of a communication? How do you convince a patient that uh, it's not a case for say uh, primary angioplasty, it's a case for a bypass? So because for a layman it might be very difficult to understand. So how do you take care of that kind of communication? So there are a lot of things which uh, play a part. Of course, uh, the reputation of the institute uh, plays a significant role. There are certain institutes uh, which are uh, known to be uh, quote-unquote trustworthy and uh, patients feel uh, very comfortable going there. Similarly, it is the issue of uh, that individual doctor uh, if uh, they have actually developed the trust factor in the society and community. So these things uh, play a significant role. Uh, the certain things which we have always uh, made sure in order to make uh, patients comfortable is uh, we call what is called as emergency to pay later. That means when patient comes with acute heart attack or has uh, issues uh, where uh, there is some emergency which has to be tackled immediately, it is not the finances which we insist on. We make sure that the patient gets the best of treatment and finances become secondary and they can always uh, talk about the payments after 24 hours, 48 hours. Uh, when you make sure that the patient is made comfortable, then he and the family, all of them are in a better frame of mind to discuss the other aspects of care. But during emergency, what is most important is the sincerity with which we take care of the patient. And I think uh, most of the times, if you look at it, uh, when two people talk to each other, it's very clear whether you can trust each other or you can't trust each other. Yeah. There are there are no rules and regulations, it cannot be put on paper, but it is just, just, just that uh, sixth sense which tells you, okay, whether we can trust each other or we can't trust uh, each other. There are some who will, whatever happens, will never trust, so nothing can be done. It's uh, harmful to their patients, but uh, most of the patients, at least what we have found, uh, we have uh, realized that there is uh, still a great amount of trust which is there in the society. Uh, we just analyzed our data of around 720 patients of acute heart attack whom uh, over a period of two years we had uh, taken to the cath lab uh, without asking for uh, any uh, money and told them that just don't bother, uh, we'll take care of the patient and uh, all other finances can be discussed later. And uh, at the end of that, uh, there were hardly less than about uh, six people who created uh, some trouble later. Most of the other people, we had no issues at all. So just for those six people, probably we would not have uh, given care to another uh, 714 uh, patients. So uh, overall, the trust in uh, medicine and trust in doctors uh, still remains. And I think in emergency situations, patients should realize that no doctor would want to harm the patient. They always try to do whatever is good for the patient. No doctor wants to get up at one o'clock in, uh, in the night and then leave the family and come to the emergency and then try to do something wrong to the patient. So always the thought process is right and I think that trust has to build up that is good both for medicine as well as uh, for patient care.
great answer sir that and uh, also uh, because of this trust thing now uh, should people really trust these uh, institutions like ours where we have these kind of very state of the art facilities and uh, we make sure that you know people are safe and they are, they are into right kind of hands uh, especially in this covid era where people are very skeptic even people with you know chronic heart conditions or chronic other uh, conditions they are they are shying away from you know visiting the hospital so what what can be uh, you know communicated to them that you know how well we are prepared to take on these even even if the the cases are of emergency cardiac procedures how prepared are we and how we are making sure that the non covid patients are not getting affected in this scenario so one about trust actually uh, dr somaraju keeps famously telling when you take a second opinion so previously probably during our training time if uh, somebody talks about second opinion it used to be considered as a insult and as if somebody is not trusting you that's not true because medicine is uh, still an unsure science we still there are many ifs and buts which are there and taking more than one opinion actually at significant amount of safety to the overall care of the patient so uh, we uh, tell our colleagues and we ourselves uh, practice we famously say that uh, when do you take second opinion so you take second opinion when you don't know the diagnosis you take second opinion when you know the diagnosis also because you never know in medicine when you don't know so you think okay this is the diagnosis but that's because of your ignorance and you never know so the team work so you were asking why people should trust a institute like us fundamentally because of the concept of team work the concept of professional excellence so when you have more than one person who is taking care of patients there are different levels of safety which are built in there is there are about three or four people who are seeing each patient giving their opinion discussing amongst themselves sitting across the table different specialties and then trying to decide what is right for the patient and then telling the patient also you have the concept of shared decision making that means there are some situations where more than one option might be there so you sit with the patient and you say okay these are the pros and cons this treatment modality the other treatment modality and what do you think is uh, you would prefer and then uh, what are the ifs and buts involved and then together we try to take a decision so these kind of things actually again uh, build up a lot of trust between the doctor and the patient and helps in uh, adding significant amount of safety uh, quality of care and then making sure that in the uh, in less amount of time you are able to give a better quality to more number of patients yeah i think uh, that summarizes the entire conversation in a better way that you know it's it's at the end of the day it's a trust and also uh, the comfort that uh, you know doctors and institutions like us give to the patient which kind of builds on and uh, kind of assures the patient that they will be uh, they will be you know taken care of in the best manner possible uh, so last thing that i would like you to say is your message on the world heart day we keep talking about you know precautions we keep talking about these things what what would be your differentiating message this time around okay so it might sound shocking but i don't want to talk anything about heart on world heart day because we are in the midst of a pandemic and uh, we it is uh, a bit uh, i feel nervous to see that at a time that uh, we have to keep our guard at the maximum we are actually lowering the guard i think uh, if uh, whoever is listening uh, i request them to actually spread this message to everyone kindly do not lower your guard your mask is your vaccination presently the reason why we need to be extremely careful about this is because the only thing 100% we know about covid today is that we don't know anything about it this is after one year and then we have seen patients in the same family a 90 year old going back whereas uh, his son or a grandson 40 year old succumbing going on to ventilator and never making it there is no particular criteria based on which you can say that okay if mr a develops covid he is going to 100% survive there is no parameter based on which you can tell so it could be somebody who is totally fit who might succumb it could be a 90 year old who recovers also so that unpredictability in covid we need to respect yeah. we need to respect till we get a vaccination kindly do not lower your guard kindly do not lower your mask keep your social distancing keep your mask on be safe till you get a vaccination next 2 3 months fight covid and we'll be through otherwise we are going to see a lot of deaths around 
if we at this point of time think that okay everything is rosy and we need not worry about covid anymore i think still covid should be the message even on world heart day yeah i think that's a very valid kind of a message also sir because uh, uh, even though there is a you know unlock 4.0 going on and things on a are going back on track in terms of business and the usual work activity we should always practice this uh, the three mantras of covid precaution high hygiene mask and social distance uh, at least till next year or so or, or till the time we have a valid vaccine which can take care of it so thank you so much sir for your time and we really those those answers were really wonderful and you know it kind of clarified a lot of aspects in terms of what uh, heart diseases are now and what we should do to you know not being in that vulnerable group thank you so much sir and uh, thank you all for joining us so uh, it's me robin jaraji member of the academic cell saying goodbye please stay safe stay healthy and uh, we'll catch up soon thank you